are going to go ahead and get started. Can everyone hear me all right, or am I going to need to use the mic? We can hear you. I think you're fine. Okay. So, um, if I could ask Denise and Jeff, uh, Reverend Denise Brown and Reverend Jeff Harrell, they're going to work. We're going to work together as a team to cover our workshop today. For those of you who I have not yet met, my name is Chuck Orpahusky. I serve as the director of the Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice, and I also am on Ann Arbor City Council. So I've got a little bit of this sight from the outside uh, advocacy community, and a little bit on the inside as somebody who is trying to work as a city council member to improve policing in the city. Yes, hi, Denise Brown, uh, co-pastor with my aunt Denise Brown, and I'm also a former board member of ICPJ, and uh, Pastor Jeff and Joe Summers and I have been working to organize uh, local faith leaders in the past year to try to work toward um, improving our approach, attitude, and principles around policing in our community. So I'm Jeff Harrod. I'm pastor the Begins Community Church of Washington County. I'm on the steering committee for um, ICPJ. Also, um, um, the chair of the education action team for Washington Week Organizing Coalition and White Mountain and Rock. So um, that's my part. Right. And so, just to give you a sense of how this workshop is going to go, we're going to start with sort of turning on the information fire hose for a little bit. Throw a lot of different things at you in terms of what are some of the policies that can be done to improve uh, race and policing? What are some of the things that are happening now? And what are some of the opportunities to act in, here in Washington County moving forward? Um, and then my hope is that we'll be able to get through that fairly quickly, about 20 minutes or so, and then have some time for some question and answer discussion. There are. Um, could I get the light switches are over there by the, by the door? So we're just going to get some flickering of the top lights on and off to try to closer across the hall. All right. So um, next slide, please. I am coming at this with the assumption that the folks who are here in this room, you don't need to be convinced that there's a problem. All right. Or more there. All right. You understand that there is a problem with policing in the United States in terms of racially disparate outcomes, in terms in terms of excessive use of force, and. We see the problems with that. They're very vivid when we have a something, you know, a Freddie Gray or a Sandra Bland or an Aura Rosser. But then there's also that day in and day out of uh, just you know folks getting put in in prison, uh, parole, arrested, etc., uh, based by racial discrimination, racial bias. And so sometimes it's in the headlines. Sometimes it's just happening on the street on a one-on-one -on -one encounter. But it's a problem. I believe you've already got that. I'm not going to try to convince you. What our focus today is, is to try to help to, we've named the problem, the Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement has named the problem. They've pointed to this thing that's been going on for decades, for, for centuries, and they said, no, we've got to fix this. Now, the next step we have to face is figure out what the solutions are, and then how do we implement them. Right? So that's the process we're going to try to go. It's more to that naming the solutions. Next slide, please. As we do that, there are a variety of sources that we're going to be drawing on. Three of the main ones are up on this slide. One is there's a campaign called Campaign Zero. The website is jointcampaignzero.org. This is a move, this is the, I think that is the policy think tank of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, DeRay McKinnon, who's been an active Twitterer um, and is running for uh, mayor in Baltimore, is one of the people behind this. Nada has also been very involved. In your last name. It's also very involved. But they put together a series of 10 policy recommendations at the state, local, and local, state, and national levels for how to address police. So that's one of the sources we're going on. A second source is uh, sort of an insider source. There's a group called PERF, Police Executive Research Forum. They're the ones in the bottom left. And they have put together a report on re engineering use of force. So this is law enforcement officials saying, you know what, this use of force thing, the way we've been doing it, isn't as good as it could be. Here are some ways we can try to do it better. And when I've talked to law enforcement officials, this has particular value because it's not just some crazy um, protester saying it. This is law enforcement saying to law enforcement, we can do better. And then the third uh, resource document we're going to be looking at is uh, the City of Ann Arbor Human Rights Commission recently put together a series of recommendations 
on civilian oversight and review of police matters. There's others that we've been studying, but these are sort of the big three foundational documents that this comes from. Next slide, please. Now, as we look at this, one of the things I want to fo focus on is we are talking specifically today about what happens in what I call the police contact box. Right? It's when an officer or a group of officers is having one-on-one -on -one contact with uh, with somebody and they're making their end of the law enforcement action. There are a lot of things, there are a lot of things that affect how race and policing work out that are outside of that police contact box. Right? We've got the school prison pipeline, we have the war on drugs, we have housing discrimination, we have mass discrimination, we have all these different factors that are all and that all affect what happens when one law enforcement officer does a traffic stop, responds to a 911 call, whatever it is. Next slide. And so these things collectively are called structural racism. We need to get what happens in that police contact box, we need to get that right. But even if we get that exactly right, that's not going to be enough. Next slide. An example of that is Brandon McKee. Uh, some of you may have heard his story. It was about a year and a half ago or so. Uh, Brandon McKean was in Oakland County, walking home, uh, hands in his pockets, and he got pulled over by an Oakland County Sheriff's deputy. He, Brandon took out his cell phone to record the encounter. The uh, deputy took out his, his cell phone to record the encounter. And they said, what are you doing? You know, why are you walking here? Why do you got your hands in your pockets? Brandon wasn't doing anything wrong. Just a 25-year-old black man walking, walking down the street. But a local business owner saw him walking down that street, felt that somehow he was suspicious and a threat, and called the cops on him. So even if the responding officer handled everything perfectly, but we still get bias-based calls like that, we're still going to have a problem. So we're focusing today on what happens in that police contact box. It's absolutely about getting this right, getting this better is going to save lives. And we need to look at all the other factors that affect, that affect who has police contact in the first place. Right? Whites and blacks, the studies show we're, we use drugs, illegal drugs, at the same rates. But you wouldn't know that looking at the arrest and incarceration rates for drug crimes. All right. So the next piece here is on uh, training. Next slide, please. And Jeff's going to cover this piece. So if we look at these four aspects of, of training that we would look at for police officers, they, they all connect together as you see these pieces connect together. Um, one thing would be cultural competency training. Um, and that will basically allow officers to understand the cultural context in which they operate. And we know this is happening for educators, it's happening for um, physicians, um, it is happening um, in many other contexts. And so it is good for officers to understand where they are in a cultural competency context. So if you've got good cultural competency training, it allows all of us to say that in my um, understanding, my relation to my acceptance of other cultures, this is where I am. And notice you would say um, not racism or cultural competency because it then allows it to say, however I got here, this is where I am. And so if you were in the keynote, you heard um, Shane Claiborne, um, when he um, talked about going to his um, college dorm in, um, in, in um, um, I think in Philadelphia, and he had his college yearbook, and the yearbook had a Confederate flag, his high school yearbook, the yearbook had a Confederate flag on it, and his roommate said, man, that's not cool, and he's saying, what? And he's saying, the flag is not cool, and what Shane brought with him was the cultural context he came out of. And so because we, in many places, are such a segregated society, we don't understand how our view of other cultures affect the things that we do. And so we can get some cultural competency training for officers um, who often don't police the communities they live in, in a, especially in an inner city or urban context. And we've had um, um, laws now that said you don't have to live in the community that you police in. And someone correct me if I'm wrong, I think that might even be the case now in the city of Ann Arbor, that you no longer have to live in the community that you police in. And so 
if you are living in culture A, policing in culture B, and if you've got some attitudes about what culture B is, then maybe there needs to be some training to help you understand the culture in which you're doing your policing in. Can I add just a couple yeah. of examples of this? It might not even be an attitude thing. It might just be a, I'm going to say it's just a straight up ignorance thing. Okay. I'm going to give two examples of that. So I grew up in northern Wisconsin, and in Wisconsin over the last 30 years there's been an increase in the Hmong population from Vietnam and Laos. Now in the Hmong community, the cultural training is, it is improper for somebody of a lower status to make direct eye contact with somebody of a higher status, right? So you've got teachers and their kids aren't making eye contact. Or you've got law enforcement officers having a traffic stop or whatever it is and the person won't make eye contact. There's nothing wrong with it, that's just the culture. But if you come from the culture I grew up, this white um, European American culture, where making direct eye contact is a sign of integrity and respect, and you see this guy's not making eye contact, you might think that he's got something to hide. And it might not be. So cultural context, cultural competency is understanding what somebody else may be coming from. Another example that, uh, that the county uh, director of the Washoe County Director of, of uh, Sheriff's Department Director of Community Engagement, Derek Jackson says. Derek Jackson grew up in West Willow, lives in West Willow. He's an African American man living in, in an African American community. And where he grew up, his parents told him, you see the cop, you head out of there. Because nothing was going to come out of it. Either they're going to catch you up with something for no good reason, or there's something bad going down that you don't want to be close to. So that's that was what his culture taught him. Now, he's, he serves with the Sheriff's Department with white officers, maybe they're from Chelsea or Manchester or wherever, they're told, you see an officer, you walk up, you shake his hand. So that officer coming from a white neighborhood with a different culture rolls into West Willow and all the kids scatter, what's he going to think? Or what's she going to think? She may think they're up to no good. So cultural competency is helping the law enforcement officers understand that their assumptions of somebody's behavior might be affected by the officer's culture and the respondent's culture, and you need to check how you interpret behavior. So I just want to give those two examples to make it a little bit more kind of um, And so if we look at also implicit bias mitigation, um, the whole concept of implicit bias is, is gaining a whole lot of traction. And that we all have um, biases that are just within us that we need to be aware of what those biases are. Um, and let me just throw this out here. Um, we got any husbands and wives in the, in the audience here? Okay. All right. Who drives? <laughs> Who drives? Wife. Wife, husband? Husband. 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 Okay. Um, now, there, there may be an implicit bias, right, within certain males that if I'm in the car with my wife, I'm supposed to drive. <laughs> Why? Because that's the way they did it at my house, right? Because you're a male. Because I'm a male. I'm supposed to drive. So something as little as that can gain tension if um, you're with a, a woman or your wife said, I want to drive. Okay? It, it may seem like a smaller thing, but it's a, it's a little example of implicit bias. Now, if I also have certain biases about other people, okay, that um, you have to watch them because they steal. Um, be careful, okay, because they, they get really emotional on you. Um, um, you know, um, there's liable to be somebody in the house that's a felon. They're running away, they must be doing something wrong. Um, if you don't talk to the police, you have something to hide. Okay, these might be implicit biases that we have that we need training with to begin to mitigate our implicit biases so that we don't bring them on folks when we meet them in police actions. Yes? I found one in a cop. And it's important. I was jumped by a man in just south of downtown Ipsy. And 
he hit me, he was going to knock me down and take my purse. But he didn't succeed. I had my shopping cart, I grabbed on and I stood firm. I was so angry, I whirled around and socked him. And there was some shocks that an old gray-haired lady would fight back that he fled. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I called the cops immediately. And within 10 minutes was a good response to the Ipsy man who came to the cop. And we sat down on the ground to talk. And I described the assailants, except that I left out race. Because I worship with the Brown Chapel AME, and we had been talking about could whatever happened in Ferguson happen here? And I said yes, and many of these nice upper middle class ladies said, oh no. And so I left out race as a test, not just of him, but of, of De Giusti had been boasting about how good his sensitivity training is. Well, let's find out. So he listened, and then he took out his ticket book or whatever, and he wrote down, and he read back to me, this six foot two, emaciated, approximately 32 year old black male, blah, 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 blah. And I said, excuse me, officer, I never said race. Well, of course he's white. No, he wasn't. He was as white as you and I. And he looked at me. He didn't right away came back and say, gee, I'm sorry. He looked at me and said, you're kidding. A white man tried to hit you? I said, see, my face it was already red. Yes, he certainly did hit me. He tried to mug me and steal my stuff. He says, I don't believe you. I said, why? Does he go to black people commit street crime? Well, in South Ipsy, listen, the man was obviously so skinny that he must have been a speed freak. And he's in need of money. He doesn't care who I am. I have this backpack. It looks like I got lots, maybe food, maybe money. It's going to deal. And he says, well, you got me. I said, no, this wasn't about getting you. If you assume he's black, and you write it that way, and I don't stop you, you're not only going to do arrest the wrong black man, because it wasn't a black man, you're going to miss the right white guy. No wonder you guys don't have a very good record for fighting the crime. And that is a very good example. That is a very good example. And it's a very good example with implicit bias in the example. Okay? Yes. Did you catch it? Yes. Okay? And four because days later, I went to the office I was told to go to in Ipsy and asked for a copy of the report. They couldn't find it. I gave them the location, the date, the approximate time, there's no record of it. So did you catch implicit bias in the example of implicit yeah. bias? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, what was it? Emaciated guy must have to be a speed freak, right? right. right? right. Or well, he could have been a cancer patient, yeah. or he could have been hungry, or he could have been homeless, or he could have just been thin, mm -hmm. right? So implicit biases come up in the best of us, right? Um, and, and especially in police, and we need to make sure we mitigate those. Um, we need to understand sound policing policies because policing policy can, can teach officers how to approach, approach people, how to have conversations, what not to assume, um, how to um, engage populations, how to de-escalate a situation. So there's what's legal, right? Things I can do, right, as a police officer but things that I might not do because because of those policies, if I do those things, I'm going to I'm going to escalate a situation. So although I might be an authority, okay, I might try talking, I might ask, um, can somebody come and be an intermediary for me? Rather than assuming just because I have authority, um, I absolutely know what's going on in this situation. And then we can understand racial context because there may be some things that happen in certain communities that are um, different in other communities. And so, you come up to a, 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 a party and um, there are certain things happening that you don't understand. Maybe there's conversation. Maybe people are very um, expressive. Um, maybe they are in each other's face in loud arguments, 
but they're not fighting, right? It's just how we roll, right? And if you and if you assume, you know, you know, can I get back up here because the fight is about to happen? The fight is not supposed to be about to happen. Okay? This is just us having conversation or or engaging each other. And so we need to understand the racial context when we act in, and also what it means for authority to come. Um, what it means for the police to approach you. What it means not to speak. And it's not just, sometimes we deal in this black-white binary. I think Chuck did very good in saying that there are other communities that have other relationships with police. Um, and there are ways that they interact. Um, and so all of these can be things that be done in training with police officers to understand the communities that they police. In, in the black community, there's something in language called code switching. Okay, that's where we talk one way, right? When I'm with um, with my family and friends, another way we talk in white in, in white community. I think officers need to know how to code switch. There may be one way you police um, in Arbor Hills, and another way you police in Icon. There may be one way you police um, in um, Superior Township, and another way you police on the um, south side of Ipsy. Are they wrong? No, they're just different for the context of the people you see. And you can have good police policies that vary between communities. Thanks, Jeff. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, it's really interesting because I thought somebody was going to talk about uh, how different groups of people express themselves verbally. And I've been accused of being an angry black woman because I raised my voice. <laughs> but I'm not angry at all. <laughs> I'm actually pretty Nobody happy. Nobody accused Shane of being loud? Hmm? Nobody accused Shane of being loud voiced. Oh, I enjoyed him. <coughs> yes. But see, he's a white male. It's okay. Now, he kind of reminded me of my church service. But anyway. <laughs> Example that you used about at the party, uh, having a good time, yes, <laughs> and getting loud and making my point. That is a cultural thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I go to my other friends' parties and everybody's very polite and very quiet. <laughs> uh, that's okay too. And I, I cracked a joke at a, a we cult taught a class on differences. It was so funny, and I made a comment about the dry, boring, uh, rabbit food. But it's not dry and boring. It's actually very healthy, and I'm eating better now. And they tease me about it the whole time. But, uh, you know, to, to me, as I before I even talk about this, I want to say that we as a people need to push back the concepts of race in our country in general. It is created here. It is created to separate us. I'm so yes. tired of that. We are, have way more things in common than we do than we have different. And until we engage each other socially and really get to know each other, you know, uh, and understand some of those sensitivities, we have to have all this training because we're too separate. If we start coming together, spending time together, I enjoy the rabbit food, you enjoy my mac and cheese, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I just think, we, you know, I just want to challenge us to start pushing separation back a little bit. The whole concept of race. No, there's one human race and it's this one race and we're all human. Is that correct? Because right. So the, uh, the use of force, uh, the documents, uh, some of the um, uh, cutting edge best practices around uh, how to deal with the use of force are coming from these particular websites and agencies. So please write them down. It's the next slide we're going to talk about uh, what those uh, issues we think are very important around use of force. So we have re-engineering -engineer, training on police use of force, police executive research forum, re-engineering and use of force, police use of force project. So uh, 
look up the website and take a look. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay, now, use of force review. And I want to tell you personally, as a person who is very passionate about uh, activism in our, in our world, the first one is the one that really motiv motivated me as a person of faith to get in this conversation and in this fight. The sanctity of human life should be at the heart of everything an agency does. And if you are a person of faith, if you believe in God, he believes in life. We believe in life. And everybody is valuable, not just the people we like or the people we don't like. But if you're here, you're a human person, your life is important. And everybody should be treated like their life is important. So somehow, philosophically, we have to come at how we interact with e each other in terms of how we value each other as human people. Adopt de-escalation as formal agency policy. Oh, how about that? How about spending some time talking to people? And I mean, there's some great training in the world. I used to have to uh, go to that kind of training myself. Uh, to, you know, even the Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. Yeah. So when people even are upset, if you begin to respond to them in a quiet, soft voice, everybody's voice goes down, right? So this should be very important uh, for, you know, and I, you know, and don't get me wrong, I mean, I think that I can speak for uh, Pastor Jeff and all of us who are working in this area. We care about police officers as well. We care about law enforcement. But we, you know, I think the point that's made is that when you have one person that refuses to respond, then it hurts everybody. So, uh, duty to intervene. Officers need to prevent other officers from using excessive force. You know, they're partners, you know, the whole culture. But yeah, like, you know, that's too much. Let's not do that. And then agency should issue regular reports to the public on use of force. And this is one of the things in our community that we really want to say to our law enforcement community. Uh, can we take a look at your record? Like, what are you doing? So, you know, how can you gauge if things are getting better if we don't have any, any numbers to measure it by? And then, you know, I'll just leave it at that. Yes. Next slide, please. And that leads us right into the next portion of the, these accountability structures, right? So it's not enough to just uh, say, okay, the police, they've got their internal investigation unit, they're going to watch themselves. We need systems of accountability to make sure that they're, you know, that they're being, that somebody's policing the police. And there's a variety of parts to this. Um, one of them is the use of body cams. Once we say body cams, there's a whole lot of other things that go with it. Right? We saw the, Chicago, the incident in Chicago where there was footage of, and the footage was suppressed for a long time. So we need to make sure, to have a body cam, yes, but make sure that they're being used, make sure that the footage is available, that we have transparency and accountability. Uh, second piece of this, is some sort of civilian review or civilian oversight uh, role. Um, just a week or so ago, there were some representatives from uh, Cincinnati in town at the Forest School talking about the efforts that have happened in Cincinnati to try to address uh, problems with excessive police violence and racial disparities in policing. And even the law enforcement rep was saying, you know, police, police civilian review boards, they get a lot of pushback, but they're a good thing. Uh, so that's another part of the accountability structures. Independent investigation and prosecution. Um, so we are familiar with the incident of Aura Rosser's death. When that happened, so now sometimes when there's a, when there's a police involved shooting, police involved injury, police involved death, it's the agency itself that does the investigation. Was this appropriate? With Aura Rosser, the, the case was handed over to the Michigan State Police, but there's nothing that requires that kind of external investigation. There's still, I've, I've still got some, some qualms, like it's still people coming at it from a police side, you know, a certain lens. They're going to carry their biases. But having a, if there's a use of force problem in an agency, 
has got to be somebody else who's taken a look and doing the investigation. Then with the Oro Rosser case, it was our own county prosecutor who made the decision whether or not to press charges against the Office of Michelle. Now, that, off, that prosecutor and his department are working with the Ann Arbor Police Department every day. They have a very close working relationship. That working relationship is important to them. So there's a even, so there's a even there's, there's the danger of a real conflict of interest or a real clouding of judgment. And there's certainly the perception that you know maybe somebody else who's taken a fresh eye who doesn't have a not working with the, the chief and the officers every day might have may take a different look at this. So having independent uh, investigation and prosecution is part of having a police accountability. And then the last thing is the data tracking and reporting. This is part of what uh, Reverend Denise was talking about, of what's happening with use of force in this. What's the breakup, racial, racial composition of people are getting pulled over for traffic stops? What are the neighborhoods that are getting the most cops? Um, so having some of that data and some of that information available so that people can review that, there's transparency, that's part of accountability as well. The fourth point, next slide please. I'm just, we're running short on time, Michelle, so I'm just going to keep us moving so we've got time for a question and answer at the end. Um, police community relationships outside of enforcement situations. I gave the example earlier of Derek Jackson's, uh, what he grew up with as an African American man in West Willow and the expectations he had around him. There are a lot of examples like that of things where if there is not a, the ability for law enforcement and other communities, particularly low income communities of color, to have uh, connections, to build understanding, and have relationships that aren't all about enforcement, then the misunderstandings have, the, have more danger to escalate, and the ability to identify when there's a problem and try to solve it drops. So having those relationships is important. Um, Next slide, please. Um, the other thing I'm just going to say, this, what I've given you so far, we think are some of the key ones. There's a lot more into this. I, it's the wrong metaphor to use on this issue, but on something else, I was having somebody tell me there are no silver bullets, only a lot of silver shrapnel. None of the, it takes a lot of these things to put together to, to solve the problem. Some of the things we're not covering in depth, um, making sure that police recruiting, um, supervision, training and promotion are, are done right. Yep. Um, one of my board members says, we don't want John Waynes on the police force. So making sure that we're getting the right people in, we're giving them the right kind of training like on shift, not just in the academy, um, that we're supervising them in a way that's enforcing the kind of behaviors we want and not the ones we don't, and that the people who are doing the best job in terms of addressing these issues are the ones that are seen as being promoted and help building that culture of accountability. Um, we need to review our policing models. Like I said earlier, the um, whites and blacks use illegal drugs at the same rate. But you still often see police deployments around drug use that are targeting communities of color. We've got to look at a lot of the other things. It's a huge topic. We don't have time to get into it today. And then the other thing that's just a tricky one, a really, a really thorny one, and got folks coming at it from all sides, is the role of police in schools. Um, I, I see I'll get to say. Um, and making sure that law enforcement in schools are not, what, what would be a schoolyard discipline issue doesn't become a legal issue. Now, somebody's not getting a record for uh, a schoolyard fight or something like that. We saw, I think a lot of us saw the tape of the incident where the cop was dragging the, the girl out of her chair and throwing her to the ground. Um, Pastor Ben Alton, Mr. Church here, has talked about a, a case where a seven-year-old in Flint, who had ADHD, was put in handcuffs by the officer in the school. That's not, there may be roles, I'm not going to say there are, but there may be roles for, for law enforcement in schools, but it's not that. So, anyway. I was on that slide, the previous you one, are. when we were doing the, the discussion with the law enforcement agencies. We've had countless hours in different trainings with police officers, and I've noticed a few things. Um, like when police are interacting with the community, it seems as if um, the police lack the ability or agenda to have creative models set. It seems like most of the answers come from the people and it's pawned off as the police attempting to have 
good models to work with. So in those trainings, you wonder, like, the police didn't come to the table with any any type of uh, answers, any type of remorse, any type of uh, tools or frameworks that they could offer to the conversation that could help them police better. It was the people who were victimized who had to come up with all these different types of understandings and ways to to cope with the abuse. And so, um, again, I, I haven't seen it. And I'm talking about, and at that specific right. conversation, it was about 22 uh, captains uh, who lacked the cultural competency to see what we were, the lens we were looking through. And I'm just saying that out loud. So I, I do believe in the role of police and the policing models and the recruiting. However, there are some lenses that even those who in leadership don't see. Absolutely. So, I, so did everybody here? So absolutely. Just having that conversation, it could just be there was an incident, uh, a conversation that happened over at the uh, Washoe County Learning Resource Center that the Jeff Harrell was calling. It was just a photo op. Because right, there wasn't that kind, there wasn't that deep analysis of it. There wasn't that kind of understanding. So you're right. Just getting people in the same room together doesn't mean anything's going to get better. I don't think it can happen unless you get people in the same room together. But just getting them in the room together doesn't guarantee anything. So and, thank you. And very briefly, to draw another point, there was a, if you can go online to the um, Union Ford School of Public Policy, catch the video about the, um, um, the review of the Cincinnati policing. Um, um, agreement that came up. Very informative. Um, one thing that one of the speakers talks about is the difference between policing and protecting. And that is, that is a key um, difference and that goes back to training. Because also within that video they talk about ways police were trained 40 years ago. That is more of a policing model. And if you look into police and keep folks in line, that's different than you're looking to protect them. And if you're looking to protect them, you don't see certain aspects of your community as people that you need to basically be wary of. They are all people that you're out to protect. You it's a building. Just to build on, I think what supports you. One of the other things that was clear from that conversation is it needs the leadership buy-in. So if the chief or the city administrator isn't on board with changing things going, it's just like you're saying. You might have everybody in the room together, but nothing's going to change. So. so uh, I saw, I'm going to take, I see, um, one, two, three, and then I'm going to put through the rest, the rest of the slides and we'll have some more time. I think you're general in the black area. You, you. I said Google something for a specific story. What keywords was that again? Um, Ford School of Public Policy, Cincinnati, and Police. And if you want to, e my email is chuck at icpj.org. If you want to shoot me an email, I will get that to you. Chuck at icpj.org. Thank you. So, um, right in line with this train of thought, uh, uh, I, I was struck by the second slide that you put up that had the police contact circle with yep. all these uh, effects around the outside. One of the things that I thought was conspicuously missing was the militarization of police and the, 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 the attitudes, the, the, the equipment, the tactics, all of that. Uh, something very important that uh, uh, the police should not think of themselves as, uh, as armed. Yeah. Which they do. Yeah, that's such a good point because I was going to uh, mention that in regards to this gentleman's comment that you have a military mindset, right? Your leadership has a military mindset. You're trained like a military person. So somehow those people who have the military lens and language needs to help train, shift that, you know, because many times they can't understand what you're saying or a creative way to change something because we don't have the same language or lens to talk to them about moving you know, from military to protect and serve. Yeah. So, yeah. The military don't see the community as their community. They see yeah. it as uh, an enemy. As the enemy, and we must subdue them. So, we've got a minute, and then we're going to cover a couple of slides. So. Uh, I think something came up about biases. Mm -hmm. uh, the example of the young man walking with his hands in his pocket. Mm -hmm on the street and some probably a business mm -hmm. yep. calls off the police. Yep. Would it not be 
fail for the police to say, okay, what is this person do before he even dies off there? That's one. Mm -hmm. Two, if that person that called the police, I'm sure the police has his phone number on their record, if that was a case that this kid is just walking down the street, it should be made to pay, made to pay for the cost of sending the police there. If you do that enough, somebody will think twice and know what is happening before they call the police. Okay, guys, uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Um, so, just I'm going to cover through these next slides and then open you know, for more question and answer, more discussion. One of the things that, as I try to figure out just how to do this here in Washington County, we really need to make these changes comprehensive. If I counted right, there are 11 different law enforcement agencies in court right here in the county. In the county. Yeah. And that's not counting when the FBI is in town or the, you know, they've got the border patrol office in Detroit. So these are just the 11 who are here in the county. So as we're trying to move training, we're trying to move accountability, we're trying to move uh, hiring, we've got to move it. And not just in one, it's not just getting the city of Ann Arbor or the city of Ipsy or the, or the county depart, um, sheriff's department to get it right. We've got all these 11 to get through. And so we really need a comprehensive piece. And some of them are, I think, doing better than others on this. The other thing I'll, I'll say is it looks different, right? Um, when I've, had, I've asked the uh, Chelsea, uh, I've, asked, I've asked police chiefs in rural communities, like, you know what I'm saying now. But I've asked police chiefs in rural communities on the western side of Washington, what, what's, what's going on here? And they said, oh, no, that's not a problem here, hmm. right? Because we know everybody, yeah. right? We know everybody. <laughs> Well, I've got, I've got a friend whose brother was having some work done in a, in a predominantly white community. He hired a contractor, an African-American contractor. Twice. Cops knocked at the door. What's going on here? And he called the owner. Twice. So it might look different in a rural, predominantly white community than it does in an urban community with a higher level of diversity or, or a higher level of people of color. But it's still there. It's still there. Um, next slide, please. So as we look at how to go from these concepts to implementation, I want, I want there's roles across a continuum for making this change. Right? Some of the roles are from outsiders pushing us, saying, you got to change this, you got to change this, you got to change this. Some of them are from insider leaders saying, we're going to change, we're going to change, we're going to change. And some of them are a hybrid of those both. There's room for all. Uh, diversity of tactics is important. Uh, next slide. Some of the things that are already in process from sort of that, I, that I'm aware of on the insider side of things, um, some of our local law enforcement deploy, departments are deploying body cams. There's still that piece about getting the policies around them right. Um, that, that's happening. The U of M Department of Public Safety has done some cultural competency training. Eastern Michigan University Department of Public Safety has brought in trainers to do implicit bias training and implicit bias training. And our police department is considering doing that kind of training. Uh, the Sheriff's Department has had some community forums like the one that Anthony mentioned where we're trying to get in sometimes in large groups, sometimes in small groups, trying to get that contact uh, across groups between that law enforcement community divide. If you're interested in learning more about that, you can contact Derek Jackson. So there's some things happening from an inside. Next slide, please. Who is Derek Jackson? Derek Jackson is the Director of Community Engagement for the Washoe County Sheriff's Office. Director of Community what? Engagement. I apologize. Could you um, show the email address? Okay, sure. Go ahead and back up one slide. Okay. Jackson D. ID Washington. Um, we'll put folks write that down. I'll just cover some of the things that are happening uh, from a sort of a hybrid approach. The Ann Arbor Human Rights Commission has put together recommendations to establish a civilian review board for, this, for the Ann Arbor Police Department. And the city of Ypsilanti has put together a um, police community relations Black Lives Matter joint task force with members of their board, the Ypsilanti City Council members, and the Human Rights Commission members. And from what I understand they're doing, is they're going through the Campaign Zero recommendations and trying to look through the lens of how those apply in Ipsy. So, um, 
Yes. Has the Ann Arbor Council reviewed the Human Rights Commission's documents on police and the police? We haven't been told about it. <laughs> I'm going to get to that in the action step. So you, you're you're at the end. Yeah, we're we're getting there. Yeah. Um, I, I just had a really quick question. The Ypsilanti Police Community Relations they put together a joint task force with Black Lives Matter. That is significant. Is it? It, it is. Significant. I'm just joking. It is. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on it. That's why. It's, it's, it's absolutely significant if we make sure it's significant. But it's it's significant that we actually join together. Black Lives Matter has caught hell mm -hmm. trying to be legitimized um, in many white eyes. And so the fact that they have a municipality willing to join with them um, says volumes, politically speaking. And many of us in our other communities could learn something from that. I think you got something to add. Yeah, I'm on that task force, and, 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 and yeah, I say that. Yes, I, it, that is awesome, and it's true. The, the fact that we have an opportunity, but I want to go to this thing. I'll be this thing called change, and it said change needs to be comprehensive. And I think um, I don't want to. I just want to. When we're thinking about change with our efforts, I'm thinking: Are we attempting to change an ideology of the police? Are we attempting to change a law? Are we attempting to change perception? Are we attempting to change day-to-day -day action? It's when, and I think you can have a group of people with different ideas of change. Um, All of your book. I mean, I get it. It's, it's a continuation. However, when we're thinking about specific missions and methods, we have to localize it and have an agenda for it. And I think when we're thinking about things like that, um, to change an ideology of a country which, which the police reinforce, I don't know how long that would take. To change a couple laws, I don't know how long it would take. But, when we think about the police as it stands, like what I re when I repeated, it, it's a four-prong approach. When we have citizens who citizens check citizens, like meaning that we don't want to be out of line. We have we have a check and balance system with citizen police. We understand it's their right to check us. You know, meaning that the citizens they have um, respect and and uh, citizens um, was not seen as police checking other police for citizens. Like there's no there's very little, since this Black Lives Matter, there's very little things that police have brought to the forefront and said, this is our contribution. Nobody in any of these videos, there's no contribution that has came from them with a genuine understanding that this is what we must offer. It's always been a collective push to make them do something. So that let me know it's not a, it should be a moral issue. And if it was moral, we would act more, it would be more expedited, that's all I'm saying. So we are the people who are gonna, create something that the police could probably use. So that's where the action is going to come from, the steel. Thank you. Which is, the next slide is some of the outside efforts. Um, so we've had a group that's been looking at, the Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice has had a group that's been looking at some of this training, research, and what, what should change there. Um, the Ann Arbor Lives of Black Lives, Radical Washington, there's other groups that have been doing protests and more, more of that pushing, like Anthony mentioned. Um, and then uh, Jeff and Denise are going to talk a little bit about what the Faith Leaders Forum has been doing on that as well. So um, I know we're, we're pushing up against time. So um, very quickly, I will tell you that if you go to the next slide here. Um, so Denise, um, mm -hmm. Denise, um, Joe Summers, and I, we began to, to last year um, look at what was happening with incidents of police shootings and and what happened with Oral Rosser, and felt that um, there was this, I'm just going to say it, this deafening silence, okay, from faith leaders in this community. Um, and so the old model of pastors, and I'll look at my own faith tradition, Christianity, and black pastors of raising up, right, and being the voice of the community, I'll find that absent, um, appallingly absent. And so we, we got together, we brought together some um, faith leaders. Um, we had about three meetings, and we come up with a draft set of recommendations of things that we would like to um, begin to address and reveal the relationship between our communities of color and a law enforcement officers. We need to sit and address the following issue use of force guidelines, citizen oversight, um, independent prosecutors. And we have someone on our, um, one of our faith leaders. Um, which is uh, Reverend Roger Green, uh, pastor of um, um, New Hope Baptist Church, who is also a criminal defense attorney and used to be an assistant county prosecutor that was gave us good insight that be careful with that independent um, prosecutor because you might get an independent prosecutor 
that is the same mindset of the prosecutor that you have. So simply because you've got a prosecutor from outside of your community, if they have the same mindset as the prosecutor you have, you might wind up with the same results. So there are things we need to watch out for there. Um, train the police officers, and we've talked about some of those issues. Um, the degree which the code of silence is operating, and that is where um, my brother who just left talks about some things that have to come um, from within police departments. You saw a slide with myself and, and Bonnie Phillips and Shirley Beckley meeting with the police chief of Ann Arbor. This was just a couple of weeks ago, which he told us that about 95% of the students within the current police academies are white males. I think that's what he told us, right? So until we begin to diversify folks going in um, and look at what structures keep folks from going in, we're, we're going to get the same product coming out, okay? Um, and the general people have not been convicted of a crime and pose no risk to the community. And so we're looking at also finding better ways to um, deal with that. You'll see that within the um, video that I talked about about Cincinnati Police. They talked about the issue of if I go to this um, call and so-and-so is drunk in the doorway, rather than keep arresting him, what we need to do as police officers find out how do we keep so-and-so from being drunk in the doorway, rather than just keep throwing him in jail. And so there can't be another mindset that comes of why we're doing it. That goes from a concept of policing, right, to protecting. And if I'm engaged with my community and I'm part of my community, then I'm saying there may be better ways of doing this, there are better ways of doing things than maybe just putting folks in jail. Yeah, and I just want to mention a little bit about the process because we're trying to bring all these diverse uh, people of faith together. And we are particularly trying to recruit uh, African American uh, ministers to the group because uh, there's been, well, anyway, we try to create a safe place for them. And it takes a while to get to a place where people can talk, feel comfortable, and then agree on something, put their name on it. And so we're in the middle of that process. and. We've been uh, pretty impressed because we've had about 30 or 40 uh, men and women of faith coming together now, and we're trying to be creating this statement and creating things because really we want to be a community force, not just for policing. Policing is now, but we want to talk about equity and we want to talk about justice in lots of other ways. And I think Chuck talked about uh, even if the police do better, until we deal with implicit bias and uh, cultural conflict and all these kinds of things in our communities, then this stuff is still here. And so I just want to share with you to pray with us and think good, good thoughts about us because we're really trying to come. And many uh, from our community, African American community, have been so hurt and, and so bothered by the things that have gone on, but for now we're creating an actual space because the people are coming out because they watch the news just like we do. Now, I want to say as I close on my part, when I watch the local news, I think the only criminals in our world are black people. Do you think that? I'm like, do, do, do white people, do you all get drunk? Do you steal stuff? Do you? I mean, I just want to know. I just want to know. Something's wrong in our country when we are this, a small percentage of a society, but we represent a huge percentage of our. Michelle's uh, product. Well, I, you know, I said I wanted to call the news station and say, are only black people criminals? Is that it? So anyway. And I want to add to very quickly to what Denise is saying. Our group, although we, we coalesce around the, the shooting of unarmed black, black um, individuals, uh, we have a very diverse group. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, quite frankly, the earlier groups were more whites than blacks. Yeah. Um, so we have... Um, Folks from different um, um, faith traditions. We have um, rabbis. We have um, um, leaders from cross denominations. Because people are really concerned yeah. about what is happening in our community. Yeah. Right. So we are running out of time. Uh, Michelle asked, "What's happening with that recommendation on the Human Rights uh, Oversight Committee for the Police?" 
on Thursday of this week, and our city council is going to vote on whether or not to receive it and take the next step in terms of staff review and move that body that forward. If you have a smartphone, you want to go to connect.act.org slash act. Right now, before you leave, you can, there's a link there that will send an email to the city council. You can tell them right here and now, support that. You can tell them right here and now, also, while you're at it, make sure that money that you're thinking about putting into the budget for uh, implicit bias mitigation training, put that money in. So those are two actions you can take right now. Uh, Denise and Jeff's uh, email phone number are up there if you want to connect with them and follow up with the Faith Leaders Forum. So these are, here's an immediate thing you can do today, and there's something else you can go on. And if you yeah. email me, I will send you this presentation. How long will it oh, take a you. person to read right. that report? To what? This, this is a report that's going to City Council. How long is it? How many pages? 30 pages, I think. Okay, so you want us to tell them to pass it without reading it. So the, the, read the, it. the resolution no, saying, the council has received it. You've got a big job ahead of you there. Council read received it months it. ago. The resolution is to say we receive it, and now we're, let's take the next step with staff review. It is not an adoption of it. It's just the next step in that process. All right, last comment, and then we've got to roll. I just have a quick comment. Our son graduated from Michigan State with a degree in criminal justice, which is supposed to be one of the best in the state, the best in the state. And my wife and I asked him about cultural training and sensitivity and race, uh, mental illness, and all this. They got nothing in their four years on any of that stuff. So it needs to go higher than just the police station. Absolutely. We were just covering the local stuff, but you're right. It needs to be state, it needs to be federal changes, and what happens in academies, and what happens in our... Okay, we have to... Yeah, people coming in, so we got...